The story begins with Narsina, a young girl recalling a terrifying moment from her childhood. She had once stood frozen in fear among monsters and goblins, watching helplessly as they killed her companions and prepared to take her life. At the last moment, a hero appeared, rescuing her from the grim fate. Years later, Narsina approaches the adventurer who saved her, asking to join his group as he searches for new teammates. He agrees, and she informs him that she is skilled in martial arts. The adventurer introduces himself as Laust, a healer by trade. Before they can continue their conversation, an employee interrupts, asking Narsina if she knows who Laust really is. Narsina responds confidently that he is a healer, but the employee corrects her. Laust only knows a basic healing spell and cannot perform advanced healing magic. She explains that Laust, like many orphans of the maze, has been an adventurer since childhood, but his lack of skill has kept him from excelling. The employee continues, pointing out that Laust was once allowed to join a group called the Thunder Supporters, but was quickly kicked out. His reputation is known throughout the town, and most adventurers avoid working with him. She warns Narsina that joining Laust could lead to financial trouble, as they might not even earn enough to afford proper lodging. Unfazed, Narsina reveals her wealth, assuring the employee that money is not an issue for her. The employee cautions her once more, stating that adventurers can be ruthless, and flaunting wealth is dangerous. Narsina thanks her for the advice, but the employee, noticing her new equipment, offers to introduce her to a reputable starter team for a small commission. Narsina declines the offer, standing firm in her decision to team up with Laust. Surprised, the employee gives them a form to register as a new team, explaining that without it, they won't receive mission referrals or help with fee disputes. Laust signs the form first, and as Narsina adds her signature, she whispers, I finally found you. The employee requests her commission, and Laust promptly pays. With that, their partnership becomes official. They shake hands, and Laust expresses his honor to be on the same team as Narsina. They begin exploring the city, with Laust explaining the mysteries of the Labyrinth of Titans. No one has fully explored the labyrinth, and many areas, along with the final boss, remain undiscovered. This has drawn adventurers from far and wide, turning the city into the largest maze city in the region. Narsina asks if they should delay their venture into the labyrinth, given the employee's recommendation to start at the Western Plains, a beginner, friendly area. Laust explains that due to the magic seeping from the labyrinth, monsters also appear in other regions, such as the forest to the north, the mountains to the east, and the wetlands to the south. The Western Plains indeed have weaker monsters, but finding them can be time consuming. Laust proposes they head to the labyrinth, where monsters appear more frequently, and assures Narsina that they won't encounter anything too dangerous unless they delve too deeply. They make their way to the labyrinth's entrance, where Narsina insists on taking the lead since she is the martial artist, while Laust is the healer. Laust is surprised but agrees, and they enter. Inside, Laust marvels at the labyrinth's eerie atmosphere and silently wonders if Narsina's combat skills are as good as she claims. Before long, monsters emerge, and Narsina swiftly and effortlessly defeats them, impressing Laust with her prowess. After the battle, Laust picks up a magic stone and explains that adventurers sell these stones to the guild for money. Curious, Narsina asks what the guild does with the stones. Laust explains that the stones are filled with energy and have various uses, something all adventurers are expected to know. Narsina admits she wasn't the best student and asks how much the stones are worth. Laust informs her that the goblin stones they've collected aren't particularly valuable, meaning they will need to defeat stronger monsters for more profitable stones. However, what they have now should cover the cost of one night's lodging. He then asks if she's ready to go deeper into the labyrinth. Narsina agrees without hesitation, promising to protect him if danger arises. 
As they venture further, Laust suddenly stops Narcina before she steps onto a hidden trap. He places a stone on the ground, triggering the trap and revealing a concealed pit. Shocked, Narcina asks how he detected it. Laust explains that one of the stones looked slightly different, a subtle detail he has learned to spot through years of experience as an adventurer. Just then, they notice a large orc patrolling the area. Laust is confused, as orcs are mid-level monsters, typically found on the lower floors. He warns Narcina that the orc is both powerful and agile, suggesting they combine their strength to take it down. He also offers the option to retreat if she feels unprepared. Narcina, brimming with confidence, tells Laust that if he believes they can win, she's ready to fight. Narcina charges at the orc, delivering a powerful kick to its stomach. To her surprise, the creature doesn't flinch. It counterattacks with a heavy swing, which she narrowly dodges. As the orc prepares for another strike, Laust steps in blocking the blow with his sword and countering with a swift attack that brings the beast down. Afterward, Narcina is surprised and questions whether Laust is truly a healer. He responds by explaining that he's been an adventurer for a long time and had to learn how to fight. She teases him, remarking that his fighting skills seem far better than just survival tactics. As they continue through the labyrinth, Laust notices that Narcina's arm is injured. She brushes it off as just a scratch, but Laust insists on healing her with his magic. They come across the orc's magic stone, and Laust observes that it contains more magic than usual, meaning they can sell it for a higher price, he suggests, returning to the guild, but Narcina wants to keep hunting monsters. Laust agrees, and they press deeper into the labyrinth. Later, they return to the adventurer's guild. Amarest, the guild employee, is shocked by the number of magic stones they collected in just half a day. She scolds Laust for taking Narcina to the deeper levels of the labyrinth, but he explains that the orc was wandering near the upper floors. Narcina chimes in, saying she wanted to explore further, but Laust stopped her. Amarest mentions that there have been reports of unusual monster movements, which has been a growing concern among the officials. When Narcina inquires further, Amarest becomes nervous and claims she doesn't know anything since she's just an employee. She then asks if they want to sell all the magic stones, and they agree. Amarest eagerly prepares their payment, thrilled, because her commission increases with more sales. After receiving their payment, Amarest advises Laust to split the money evenly with Narcina. Laust is shocked to realize that half of the earnings is still 10 times more than what he usually makes. Amarest reassures them that if they ever have a dispute over money, the guild will help mediate. She also offers to handle any other issues they might have, but Laus declines, explaining that he left his old group and has no plans to rejoin. As they leave the guild, a man named Hansom watches them. He asks Amarest if Laus has joined a new team. Amarest responds that she didn't recommend Laus to any group because no one would want him. She even calls him ignorant, when Hansom inquires about the girl with Laust, Amarest reveals that her name is Narcina, the one fighting alongside him. Later, Laust and Narcina go to a restaurant. The waitress recognizes Laust and mentions that word has spread about him forming a new team. Laust dismisses the comment, saying he's more focused on food for now, but they need to book rooms first. The waitress offers them two rooms and informs Laust that the entire second floor is available so they can choose any rooms they like. Afterward, they eat and then retire to their rooms. Narcina reflects on her childhood, recalling the time when Laust saved her with his magic in the forest. She thanks him silently, remembering how she decided to become an adventurer so she could form a team with him and protect him. In the present, Narcina thinks about how she trained hard for this moment. When she heard Laust had been kicked out his previous team, she rushed to the city immediately. She managed to form a team with him, and together they defeated goblins. She did all this for him, but he still doesn't recognize her. She realizes that she has grown taller. Her clothes have changed, and her hair color is different now. 
Meanwhile, Laust has grown so strong that he no longer needs saving. Determined, Narcina vows to keep her promise to protect him, but she feels a pang of sadness when she hears people in town calling Laust ignorant. The next day, in a swamp, a group of adventurers faced a seven-headed hydra, though two of its heads had already been severed. Marglis, the warrior in golden armor, stood at the front, but he looked uneasy. Armia, the sorceress beside him, was even more nervous. The rogue Siberia was too injured to fight, and Lost was busy tending to her wounds. He couldn't cure the poison, but he could restore her strength. Siberia complained that the healer was useless, which led Margulis to tell them to stop arguing and return to the battle if the healing was done. But the healing wasn't finished, as Lost couldn't remove the poison. He mentioned they should have brought an antidote, but the leader had said it was too late and blamed Lost for being a worthless healer. Just then, the Hydra attacked again, aiming for Margulis, who blocked the strike with his sword and shouted for Armia to cast a spell. Armia fired a fireball, but it barely scratched the beast. Frustrated, Margulis called his teammates useless. Unwilling to continue the mission alone, he decided to retreat, leaving his companions behind. Armia followed him, while Lost carried Saberia in his arms. The scene then flashes back to when Margulis expelled Lost from their group, Lightning Blades. Saberia accused Lost of causing their failure to defeat the Hydra, but Lost argued that maybe it was also their fault, since they stayed up all night doing nothing and weren't at their best. Margulis asked if Lost was blaming them, though that wasn't what he had meant. Siberia suggested they ask Armia whose fault it was. Nervous, the sorceress glanced at the leader and pointing to Lost, blamed him. At that moment, Lost woke up from his dream, sweating, realizing that the memory still bothered him more than he thought. It reminded him of something that happened six years ago when he was known as Lost the Useless but still wanted to be a top tier adventurer. Back then, another group had reached out to him, but they didn't want a healer they needed to bait. For a labyrinth orphan like Lost, this was common. What he didn't expect was that the monsters would turn on the group and wipe them out. When Lost left the dungeon, he was traumatized, never being acknowledged. On that day, he stumbled upon an overturned carriage surrounded by goblins. Amid the chaos, a defenseless girl was in danger, and without thinking, Lost rushed to help her. He never fully understood why he acted so impulsively, perhaps because he thought his life wasn't worth much. Maybe he believed trading his life to save hers would give his death meaning. During the fight, he was knocked unconscious. Hours later, he woke up next to the girl, along with knights who had rescued her and finished the battle. In the end, it wasn't Lost who saved her, he remained useless. As he reflected on this, the girl thanked him, saying that without his efforts, the knights wouldn't have arrived in time. Embarrassed, Lost healed a wound on her arm, saying that was all he could do. He explained how his former companions had thrown him to the wolves, which horrified the girl. She cried at their cruelty and vowed that when she grew up, she'd become an adventurer and form a party with him. Though Lost doubted she'd ever become an adventurer, since she was a noble's daughter, her words still inspired him. Determined, he trained hard and found a mentor, continuing as a healer but learning other adventurer skills. Eventually, he joined the Lightning Blades. Considering all of this, it made sense that Lost would dream about that event. If it hadn't been for that girl's words, he might have given up on being an adventurer and never met Narcina. Speaking of Narcina, she knocked on Lost just then, asking if he was awake. When he opened the door, she invited him to have breakfast with her, and the two set off to share a meal. Later, they returned to the dungeon and ventured deeper than before. Eventually, they found a teleportation circle. Lost explained that these weren't found in every labyrinth and were likely placed by a mage after the labyrinth was discovered. Narcina wondered if it could transport them to other places. Lost explained that you'd need another circle to exit, as it's a one-way trip. Narcina thought it would be easier if the city had one, but quickly realized monsters could invade the city if that happened. Lost chuckled, assuring her that monsters couldn't use these circles. He added that the knowledge to create teleportation circles had been lost for centuries, and while practical, no one knew how to make new ones anymore. With that, the pair stepped into the circle and were transported to the other side. They found themselves in a red-hued section of the dungeon, much deeper than before. Unlike the upper levels with their greenish tones, this part was tougher. Narcina, inexperienced, tried using her usual martial arts techniques against a lich, but couldn't land a hit. Leechers are spiritual beings made of pure energy, making them immune to physical attacks. Lost thinks it's best to retreat, but Narcina is determined and insists she can defeat the lich. Together, they form a plan. Lost distracts the lich, making it chase after him. 
So when this happens, lost reflects on how, with enough training, people can control their prana spiritual energy within. A skilled martial artists can envelop their fists in prana, allowing them to strike down spiritual beings. Using this technique, Narcina lands a powerful punch, defeating the Lich. Though victorious, Narcina was injured during her first attempt to hit the spirit. Lost uses a special item to enhance his healing spell, thanks to a magical stone embedded in it, which amplifies the spell's power. So these magical stones are crafted into items by artisans and passed on to adventurers. After being healed, Narcina wonders how much they'll profit from the magical stone they obtain by defeating the Lich. Back at the guild, Amherst is amazed by the number of stones the duo collected and asks them to return often. As they leave the guild at night, Lost remarks on how surprised he is by the money they earned, and Narcina agrees. Suddenly, a crowd forms ahead where two men are fighting. The duo approaches, and Lost observes that disputes like this had become common, with troubled adventurers flocking to the city. This reminds Narcina of something Amherst mentioned. Lost explains it's a huge inconvenience for rule-abiding adventurers and townspeople, but he lets it go, saying it's time to celebrate their earnings with a nice drink. Their dinner is lavish, and as the plates are set, Mary, the tavern owner, asks Lost if he can pay for everything. He reassures her that he can and even orders some beer. Narcina also asks for beer, but Mary's daughter informs her they don't serve alcohol to children. Narcina is about to protest, but Lost agrees it's too soon for her to drink. As they eat, Narcina asks about a strange building in the city with no doors or windows. She's seen several and doesn't know what they're for. Lost admits he's curious too. He learned that even the workers who built them didn't know what they were for or ordered them. The project came through several agents, making the true commissioner a mystery. Narcina comments that whoever ordered the buildings clearly didn't want to be known. Lost isn't bothered, as long as it's harmless, though he wishes they had built a wall around the city instead of these strange structures. Narcina agrees, noting the city could be vulnerable since it doesn't even have a moat, but she enjoys the open view. Lost insists it's a bad idea in times of war, as it would be easy for enemies to invade. Narcina isn't worried, saying adventurers can handle whatever threats appear, whether thieves or monsters. Later, after returning home and saying goodnight, they head to their rooms. However, Narcina briefly calls out to Lost, but then changes her mind and pretends it was nothing. As she lies in bed, she regrets not saying she wished they could share a room. Meanwhile, Lost feels content to be part of a group again. Even though he believes he'll never see the little girl who inspired him again, thanks to Narcina, he feels he can keep adventuring for a while longer. The next day, Margulis introduces the newest healer of the Lightning Blades, a girl named Lyra. She greets the group, but the other women aren't happy. Siberia avoids her, and Armia struggles to say anything. Meanwhile, the leader is overjoyed, confident they'll finally be able to defeat the Hydra. Thanks for watching my recaps. If you enjoyed it, then don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more in my recaps. In a dark territory surrounded by dead trees and shadows, Margulis notices that the Hydra's severed heads still haven't regrown. With this in mind, he announces that he and Lyra will lead the attack, Armia will stay back for magical support, and Siberia should sneak around to catch the enemy off guard. However, Lyra reminds him that she's a healer and shouldn't be on the front lines which the leader finds strange because Lost, their previous healer, always did. She finds it absurd to force a healer into close combat, but Margulis explains that Lost used to charge in recklessly, sometimes landing a good hit. Siberia adds that Lost was the one who cut off the Hydra's heads. Despite this, Margulis insists Lyra stay in the rear due to her limitations, as he'll handle the front alone. Meanwhile, Lost and his partner return to the guild after another day of gathering. They trade the items they collected for money. Amherst, the receptionist, assumes they went back to the intermediate levels of the dungeon and warns them to be careful since exploring in pairs has its limits. She even suggests they recruit more members to handle bigger challenges. Lost agrees it's a good idea, but prefers to keep things as they are for now. Still, Amherst compliments their performance, saying they'll soon be able to afford renting a house with the money they've been making. Narcina doesn't quite understand, so Lost explains that groups with enough money can rent private houses and use them as their base. Amherst adds that inns have storage limits and renting a house isn't cheap, but since they're a couple, they could also use it as a love nest. Embarrassed by this, Narcina becomes furious. Lost recalls that the Lightning Blade group also rented a house, but his room was just used as storage. And Amherst reflects that they really took advantage of Lost's kindness, and in the end, it was probably for the best that he got kicked out. 
As night falls, Margulis seethes with anger, having failed once again to defeat the Hydra. While healing Armia, Lyra notices how eager Margulis is to face the creature head-on, despite not being strong enough. This forces the warrior to accept the harsh truth. Sabiria and Margulis admit that Lost wasn't as useless as they had thought. Despite the complaints, he got the job done, and he never even realized they were paying him less than he deserved. This makes Margulis wonder why Lost left, to which the rogue reminds him that it was Margulis who kicked him out. Comically surprised, Margulis doesn't even remember doing so, but now that he knows, he figures it'll be easy to reconcile. He plans to go to the guild and ask Lost to return because no one would turn down an invitation from the famous Lightning Blade group. Hours later, Armia wakes up to find Lyra asleep beside her. Lyra had stayed by her side until she couldn't keep her eyes open any longer. Armia gently wakes Lyra, who asks how she's feeling. Armia assures her she's much better. Grateful, Lyra offers to fetch something for her to eat. When Armia agrees, Lyra goes to find the others, only to discover they had gone to the guild to invite Lost back to the group. Everyone at the guild is stunned by the proposal while Lost tries to process what he just heard. Margulis repeats himself and Amherst explains to Narcina that Margulis is Lost's former leader. Margulis adds that he understands why Lost hesitates to return its tough keeping up with a first-class adventurer like him. But there's no need to worry because Margulis will always be there to save his beloved healer if anything goes wrong. Lost responds that this isn't the issue, but Margulis assumes it's about the money. He mentions that there was a mistake in Lost's previous payments, though he's not sure how that happened. Pushing that aside, Margulis insists that their new healer is useless and it would be great if Lost rejoined the team. After hearing the offer, Lost smiles and thanks him, leading everyone to believe he's going to rejoin the Lightning Blade. Outraged, Narcina steps in front of him, determined to stop that awful man from laying a finger on her friend. After all, Lost is now her partner and is greatly valued. Lost thanks Narcina for standing up for him and explains to Margulis that he only said, thank you out of politeness. He has a new group now and has no desire to leave it. Margulis urges him to reconsider, accusing Narcina of trying to exploit him and manipulate his pay. To make matters worse, he accuses the guild of being complicit and tells Lost he's being deceived. Fed up, Lost loses his patience, grabs Margulis by the wrist, and tells him he holds no grudge for the past. But if Margulis keeps accusing Narcina, he doesn't know what he'll do. After that, Lost walks away without further explanation. Furious, Margulis demands that Amherst introduce him to a new adventurer strong enough to hold the front lines. The guild employee is tired of this request, but Margulis loudly declares that the Lightning Blade will defeat the Hydra no matter what. At that moment, a man steps forward, offering his services. Margulis sizes him up and draws his sword to test the newcomer's skills. Amherst warns Margulis that the guild isn't a place for fighting, but the warrior doesn't care and rushes at the stranger. In the blink of an eye, Margulis is easily disarmed, leaving everyone in awe of the adventurer's skill. Trying to save face, Margulis shouts to the crowd that he was just going easy on the stranger but decides to recruit him anyway. Siberia asks if he's really going to trust someone who doesn't even show his face. Margulis replies that he only needs strength, nothing else. Besides, they don't have time for mistakes anymore. If they keep failing against the Hydra, rumors will spread that the Lightning Blade can't defeat it, and that will destroy the group's reputation. Margulis then asks for the recruit's name, and the stranger replies, Shig, though he stumbles as if he made it up on the spot. Later, Narcina hears a knock at the door. She checks to find Sheila, the innkeeper's daughter, at Lost's room. For a moment, Narcina feels suspicious, but convinces herself that Sheila wouldn't deceive her. Lost shows up, and Sheila tells them they have visitors. The two head downstairs and meet Lyra and Army at one of the tables. Armia quickly apologizes, acknowledging that this isn't something she should be discussing with Lost, but she really needs help. Lyra explains that Margulis has hired a new warrior and is going after the Hydra again. Armia adds that she now realizes how strong Lost was, because if he hadn't cut off some of the Hydra's heads, the whole team would have been wiped out. She asks Lost to join them again to finish the Hydra off once and for all. Faced with this new request, Lost guesses Armia doesn't know that Margulis made the same offer earlier. Narcina questions why Armia wants to help this group, considering how hard it must be dealing with Margulis. Armia admits Margulis is authoritarian, impulsive, cowardly, rude, stubborn, vengeful, greedy, and never brushes his teeth. But despite all that, he's still her companion. At this, Narcina slams her hand on the table, asking why Armia let Lost be mistreated in the group without doing anything. Armia confesses she was too scared to stand up to Margulis and Sabiria as she was the one who wrongly accused Lost of causing their defeat. As she remembers this, 
Armia starts to cry, explaining that she's new to adventuring and didn't understand what she was doing. She now realizes Margulis was wrong, but she still can't turn her back on a companion. Just then, Mary arrives with a feast, insisting Armia looks too pale and can't leave with a sad face. As Armia eats, Narcina asks if she could take the mage out of the group with her, but Armia replies that if she could, she wouldn't still be with them. Lyra adds that Armia is a kind person. The Lost recalls Margul is calling her useless. He remarks that Lyra too will struggle with the group. Despite this, Lyra says she can't leave Armia behind, and Lost understands. Later, Lyra returns home and runs into the new recruit of the Lightning Blade. She calls him Sieg, but Margulis corrects her, saying his name is Shea. With no more time for delays, Margulis gathers the team for another attempt against the Hydra. Lyra confronts Sieg, asking what he's doing there. Sieg pretends not to know her, but as he turns, she recognizes Ronaldo's sword. She asks if it was stolen. Nervously, Sieg claims he inherited it from his mentor, but realizing he said too much, he denies ever hearing of Ronaldo. Meanwhile, Lost and Narcina set off on another journey. At the same time, the Lightning Blade heads out, with Margulis more confident than ever as they march into Hydra Territory. We then see Marcina face a group of large, muscular orcs armed with heavy clubs. Using her fighting skills, she only needs her own strength to defeat these opponents, each one over three times her size. After taking down the orcs, Lost asks Marcina if she wants to rest, but she appears ready to keep going. Just then, her stomach rumbles, making the healer laugh as he teases that even the tireless Marcina gets hungry. With that, he invites her to join him for lunch. Soon, when the food is prepared, Lost is stunned by the amount they have. Marcina explains that Mary from the inn noticed she hadn't eaten anything and packed this feast for her. As they eat, the healer mentions the Hydra, a highly venomous creature with a muscular body and scales that resist both physical and magical attacks. Hearing this, Marcina looks worried and asks about the Hydra's whereabouts. Lost explains that although they're not found everywhere, they're fairly common compared to even stronger monsters. He mentions that research has led to some effective strategies against them, like an antidote for their venom, which is fatal without treatment. The antidote is available in Marnat, though it isn't cheap, so many groups rely on support healers. For the Blade of Lightning team, Lyra will carefully monitor the group. Lost assures Marcina that, although Margulis often brags, he is a skilled swordsman who can be formidable if he stays in shape and takes the opponent seriously. Siberia is also highly skilled in speed and agility. Since the Hydra has multiple heads with a wide field of vision, Siberia might still manage to sneak around and attack from behind. Hearing this, Marcina comments that Lost seems full of praise for Blade of Lightning. Lost, slightly embarrassed, replies that he's only stating the facts. Marcina lets it go and changes the subject, mentioning that they always go to the same labyrinth, which is becoming tiring. Lost asks if she'd like to try somewhere different, and she suggests they check out the nearby swamps. Meanwhile, Blade of Lightning confronts the Hydra, Margulis lands a powerful blow on one of its necks, and then C steps in, cutting off another head. When it's time to strike a second head, C hesitates, and Margulis accuses him of holding back to let the leader get credit as a Hydra Slayer. Laughing arrogantly, Margulis charges at the Hydra, but nearly gets hit in the process. While healing Siberia, Lyra questions Margulis' reckless approach, but Siberia just says that it's all part of the night's thrill. Lyra shrugs off the answer, heals her partner, and Siberia jumps back into the fight. The healer, observing the fight, notes that C's earlier attacks have already weakened the Hydra, making it move more slowly. Siberia distracts the Hydra, allowing Margulis to keep striking, and Armia supports them with her spells. At this pace, they're confident the Hydra will be defeated. Suddenly, the Hydra throws a rock at Armia, knocking her down and making her vulnerable. One of the Hydra's heads approaches her, and the fear she feels releases an unusual substance that confuses Siberia. Seed explains that monsters can absorb a person's fear and transform it into energy. C is surprised since this fear is usually invisible. Lara touches the energy in the air and senses it is mana, a force normally found only deep within a labyrinth. As the Hydra absorbs this mana, it begins mutating, as monsters are capable of transforming themselves by absorbing large amounts of mana. In response, Seed tells Lyra to look after Armia and calls Margulis to retreat. Margulis protests, eager to continue and earn the title of Hydra Slayer. But as he strikes, his weapon breaks, leaving him defenseless. The Hydra attacks, but Lost arrives in time to save him. Seeing the healer's arrival, C asks Lost to care for Armia. When Lost reaches her, he asks Lyra about her condition. 
Lyra explains that as a sorceress, Armia has high resistance to magic, so healing spells may not work well on her. Lost takes charge and casts multiple healing spells, one after the other, a technique he used during his time with Blade of Lightning. Lyra, surprised, remarks that this approach is like treating a cold with too much medicine. Yet, Armia begins to regain consciousness, though she's not yet ready to fight. Then, Sieg warns that the Hydra appears to be focused on Lost. The healer explains that it likely remembers him from past encounters. Marcina volunteers to help, and Lost agrees, but reminds her to back off if it becomes too dangerous. At the same time, Sieg suggested that the rest of Blade of Lightning stay out of the fight, and everyone agreed, especially since Margulis was now unarmed due to his broken sword. So Lost and Narcina attacked the Hydra together, showing a strength Margulis never knew his former teammate had. The warrior was puzzled about why Seed's sword didn't break. Lara explained that Seed's weapon was magical, a legendary sword with immense power. Margulis thought such equipment was only a myth, but if it were real, he wondered how Seed managed to wield it. Meanwhile, Narcina kept up her attacks on the Hydra, but was eventually struck and taken hostage. Lost deduced that the Hydra wanted a one-on-one -on -one fight. Narcina couldn't understand how a monster could be this intelligent. Lair explained that creatures that mutate can develop both higher intelligence and cruelty. With that, Lost ordered everyone to stay back and charged at his massive opponent. At that moment, a man far away observed the flame of a candle flicker, wrote something on a piece of paper, and closed his eyes. This caused Lost to suddenly collapse. Lost tried to get up to help his fallen friend, but quickly lost consciousness. Moments later, he awoke with powerful energy flowing through his body. The man who caused this reaction wondered aloud about something that should have stayed dormant. Then, a horn appeared on Lost's forehead. The Hydra charged at him, but Lost instantly reacted, slicing off all the creature's heads in a single blow, ending the fight. Exhausted, Lost collapsed again. When he woke up, he asked about Narcina's condition, and she reassured him, explaining that Lyra had given her an antidote. Lyra made sure to mention it was quite expensive, so she expected reimbursement. Narcina then questioned Lost about his strange transformation, but he had no idea what she was talking about. Margulis, feigning admiration, declared he always knew how remarkable Lost was, and that with him, they could defeat even the most challenging monsters, including the master of Mardet Labyrinth. He then promised to split the Hydra's magic stones among three people. Confused, the healer asked why only three, and Margulis explained that it would go to him, Lost, and Siberia since the rookies hadn't contributed much and would have their pay doc. He added that the young woman who came with the healer was only an assistant and wouldn't receive anything. When Lost inquired about Armia, Siberia coldly responded that Armia was gone, as they weren't even sure she'd ever wake up, let alone be useful as a mage. Margulis suggested they could sell her, remarking that she was attractive and would appeal to certain buyers. Without hesitation, Narcina punched Margulis, who began threatening to expel her from the guild, citing rules against fighting among adventurers. However, Steve and Lorara claimed they hadn't seen anything, shutting down his argument. Siberia, however, said she'd seen it and would testify for the leader. Steve quickly changed his stance, admitting he'd heard Margulis discuss selling their teammate on the black market. As a guild representative, he ordered everyone to follow him. Back in the city, everyone learned that C was a royal adventurer sent by the Adventurer's Guild to investigate due to safety issues in the area. During his investigation of Blade of Lightning, he discovered their actions and decided they would be expelled from the guild. Due to the human trafficking threat, they were sentenced to forced labor for life. As Margulis and Siberia panicked, Lost called C to side to talk. Outside, he asked the representative to show mercy, believing that, although Margulis and Siberia were now motivated by fame and wealth, they hadn't always been that way. He hoped they could have a second chance to change. Hearing this, Seed ordered Margulis and Siberia to go to the farthest city they could find and never return. The pair quickly agreed and left before he could change his mind. Amber asked if that was the right decision, and he replied that he'd stay in Mardet to keep an eye on them. Narcina felt guilty about causing their exile, but Lost reassured her that it was the best choice. He thanked her for all her help and told her he looked forward to more of their adventures together. Later, Seed and Lyra discussed the importance of watching the Marduk Guild since the royal city suspected the issues there might be related to the local branch or its master. He asked her group, the Helioformal, to assist in this task. Lyra agreed, as long as Armia was included since she couldn't abandon the young mage. Seed readily agreed, feeling that he, too, wanted to stay close to Lost and these promising young adventurers. If you enjoyed this, drop a comment and subscribe for more.